You know what might help make 2020 just a little better? How about a COVID-19 vaccine? That said, one could actually get approved this week. We all know a lot of people have a lot of questions about it, so we're going to try and answer them. But there are some people who aren't really focused on the vaccine, and that's because they've been battling COVID for months. The moments you feel okay, other moments all of a sudden you're like, I'm dying. We're checking in with one of the so-called long haulers. Plus, it's Pearl Harbor Day, and we dug a pretty great story for you out of the KGW vault involving an Oregon college football team who got called in to action. Instead of you, ma'am, been mobilized, been mobilized yet, and they said no. And he said, well, you are now. Here's the story. I, you guys are going to like this story. It's coming up right up the top here. I'm Dan Haggerty. Hi, welcome to the story. It's Monday. It feels like Monday. How's everybody doing? I hope you're doing well. Let me know. This is a show that likes to have a conversation, so email me at the story at kgw.com. Leave me a Facebook comment or use Twitter and that hashtag HeyDan. So we are going to start things off a little differently tonight because that's what we try to do here on the show. We want to be a little bit different, look different than the other 6 o'clock newscasts in, in town. And we know a lot of you are history buffs, so you probably know it's been 79 years since the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, which got the U.S. involved in World War II. But here's something that you might not know. An Oregon football team was actually in Hawaii at the time, and they got called into action. Sunrise producer Andrew Dorn found this in the KGW vault. We have witnessed this morning a severe bombing of Pearl Harbor by enemy planes and planes. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese military attacked the American naval base at Pearl Harbor, killing more than 2,000 soldiers and decimating the U.S. Navy's Pacific Fleet. America was going to war. As news of the attack hit the wires, Oregonians held their breath. Some of their own were on the island. A local college football team caught in the chaos. Just days earlier, the 1941 Willamette Bearcats had arrived in Honolulu. Traveling over 2,000 miles by sea, they were in town for the Shrine Bowl, a series of exhibition games in America's normally peaceful paradise. Having won the Northwest Conference back home, the team was eager to test themselves against tough competition. Quarterback Ken Jacobson brought his camera along, snapping this picture from the team's hotel overlooking iconic Waikiki Beach. It was the perfect end to a successful season. On December 6th, the Shrine Bowl began. The team lost their first game to the University of Hawaii. It would be the only game the Bearcats played. The next morning, confusion. Something had happened. Rumors of an attack at the nearby naval base. Within hours, martial law was declared. The football teams, players, and staff were called into action. A military car came by, and uh, one of the officers, there was an officer in the car, and stuck his head out the window and said, have you men been mobilized? <laughs> been mobilized yet? And they said, no. And he said, well, you are now. Author Bill McWilliams, an Air Force veteran, wrote a book on the Bearcats' trip to Hawaii, Scrimmage for War. In the days after the attack, leaders feared a land invasion could be coming. The Willamette football team and others were armed and placed on guard. They were handed wartime duties that uh, had them occupied right up until the time they got on board the ship to come home. They were having to dig uh, lay barbed wire and dig firing positions. It would be nearly two weeks before it was safe to evacuate the team. With only a few hours notice, they were scrambled to the SS Coolidge for the journey home. Overcrowded and filled with wounded soldiers, the team did what they could to help, supporting medical staff and preparing lifeboats in the event they needed to abandon ship. On Christmas Day, 1941, the team arrived in San Francisco, their Hawaiian nightmare finally over. Many would go on to serve in the war, but none would forget December 7th, the day they defended their country on the sandy beaches of Waikiki. 
Okay, let's talk about our big story now, which is, of course, the big story of the year, COVID-19. But for the first time, we're starting to see a little light at the end of the tunnel, and that's because the FDA is holding a hearing on Thursday on the Pfizer vaccine, and they could give it emergency approval. What that means is the very first doses could be going out by the end of this week, if you can believe it. But before you get too excited or, or too anything, remember, you're likely not going to be one of the first people in line, unless you're a healthcare worker, because healthcare workers are going to be getting them first. It's likely going to be months before the general public can actually get one. Now, a lot of you have been sending in a lot of questions about the vaccine because who doesn't have a ton of questions about this right now? Kristen Severance has been trying to get some answers for us. Yeah, Dan, this first question is so good because it shows that, you know, the story viewers are really paying attention, not just to the vaccine, but to the numbers that the state is reporting and that we're reporting. So this viewer writes, why don't the number of vaccine doses that Oregon is receiving match up? So on Friday, you may remember, we told you that Governor Kate Brown announced 147,000 Pfizer and Moderna vaccines headed to Oregon by December 15th and 140 20,000 of the second doses would arrive by December 29th. You need to get two shots for this vaccine to work. And some viewers wondered why the numbers were not exactly the same. So we reached out to the Oregon Health Authority. A spokesman told us the numbers are changing so quickly. They really are confident, though, that they will be allocated the same amount of the first and second doses. And if they don't get the same amount of second doses as the first, they won't give that first shot. Worst case scenario, they could move some of the first doses to the second round, but again, they believe that they'll end up with the exact same amount of second doses as the first. Again, as Dan said, all of these first vaccines will be going to healthcare workers. All right, our next viewer question, can employers force you to get the vaccine? Yes, they can. Employers can uh, force you to get a vaccine. You can have a vaccine mandate with some exceptions. Oregon is one of 15 states that allows for philosophical and religious exemptions when it comes to vaccines. Last question, tons of interest about kids and COVID-19. What is the status of a COVID vaccine for kids? The answer here, we just don't know. Health experts, including Dr. Anthony Fauci, recently said that these vaccines will not initially be available to kids because few kids have participated in clinical trials for the vaccine. Now, children's immune systems are different from adults, and there might be some discrepancies in the vaccine's effectiveness between the two age groups, but we know, you know, right away that they will not be given the vaccine. Do you have a question about the COVID-19 vaccine? I'm sure you do. Let us know. Just use that hashtag. Hey, Dan. Now, last week on the story, we talked about contact tracing apps. Uh, basically, you can sign up for alerts that will tell you if you're exposed to someone with COVID. But I do want to clear up a little bit of confusion because it, this can easily be confusing. And we got uh, a lot of uh, questions about it. And it all really depends on where you live. See, Washington has a contact tracing app. It's called WAB Notifier. WA notifier would know it's you get my point. If you live in Washington, you can download it right now on your phone. Oregon, on the other hand, doesn't have one of these apps yet apps yet, but they're working on it. It's kind of stuck in the pilot program phase at OSU. We really don't know when it's going to be ready, but it's supposed to use basically the same technology as the Washington app. So in that case, some of you might be wondering, well, why can't I just download the Washington app? We live right on the border. Maybe I live in Oregon. So what? Well, we asked Oregon Health Authority about that. And while technically you can do that, but it just won't work quite as well. It will only notify you if you're exposed to someone who tested positive for COVID in Washington. So if you walk by someone who tested positive in Oregon, it's not going to send you alert. But if you live in Oregon and you work in Washington or vice versa, maybe it's possibly something useful for you. Now, speaking of all this, here's something we think is worth your time. The Washington Post has a big FAQ on contact tracing apps. It's free. It's not behind a paywall or anything, so anybody can go on and read it. They answer a bunch of questions like which states have these apps set up, which phones they'll work on, what happens if you travel a lot out of state, and how do you know if, you're not, if they're not violating your privacy with these apps, which I know some people are very, very concerned with. And something I've been wondering really through all of this is do they even do anything? Will this work? Will it actually stop the spread of COVID? And the short answer is they think so, but enough people actually have to sign up for these apps to be effective. And check that out right now on Washington Post's website. So as of today, more than 85,000 Oregonians have been diagnosed with COVID. Now, most people recover completely in a few days or a few weeks, but some have symptoms for months. 
This week, Morgan Romero talks with several of these people in a series she's calling COVID the long haul. Today, we hear from Lee, a woman who's been battling COVID since March. How hard have the last, you know, eight or nine months been not knowing if or when you were going to be yourself again? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. That was a huge fear during the summer. You know, is this my per new permanent state of being? Is this, is this who I am from now on? You know, I've gone from being able to do high level research work and project management to barely being able to do that, barely being able to just manage my own household. Um, Will I be able to run again? Because I love running. It's such a, a mental release for me. Um, will I be able to do the, all of that? And that was really scary. Um, that, yeah, that was probably one of the, the scariest part. I had a big breakdown in September, just sobbing. Will I be able to run again? I miss running so much. Um, but I'm so thankful that... It's getting better. It's getting better. I don't know if or when it will be 100%, but I'm hopeful. Okay, let's take a minute and speak to Morgan Romero about this series she's working on and the people that she talked to. Morgan, explain to me what it means to be a long hauler. You, you mentioned these people are, are, they don't feel right for about nine months. Does that mean that they are having COVID symptoms, like a sore throat and a cough for, for nine months? Or does it mean that they just don't quite feel 100% yet? So it really depends on the person, right? You can't put them all in one box. Some people are dealing with those symptoms that you just talked about, and they've been dealing with those same symptoms for the last eight or nine months if they got COVID back in the spring. Others, though, are dealing with, you know, headaches and fatigue and shortness of breath still. A very common thing that a lot of people talk about that are considered long haulers or those dealing with, you know, we call it long COVID, is uh, depression and anxiety and difficulty focusing. And they call it COVID brain. It's this brain fog. So a lot of them really not to their baseline normal health just yet. But some at this point, it's interesting after talking to several people, some are starting to finally feel some semblance of normalcy again, Dan. We talk about a lot of the, the categories, right? The, the age group that's most likely to spread the virus or the, the category of people who are most likely to suffer from extreme symptoms. What about when it comes to long haulers? Is, is there something I could know about myself that would make me um, more likely to be a long hauler? Yeah, that's an interesting point. Really, you know, we say COVID can affect everyone and it's the same thing with long haul. It's, it, it's these people that get a mild form of the virus. It's these people that get a severe form of the virus. You could be hospitalized. You could be not hospitalized. You could be elderly. You could be 25 years old. And again, you could have that mild virus where you get over it in two weeks or you get over it in four weeks. But all these months later, you know, you're still dealing with a, a lack of taste or smell. So it could affect everyone. We don't know. The CDC is still studying as well as the World Health Organization who is going to get these symptoms and when or if they'll ever ever resolve themselves. Yeah. So and to just kind of keep that conversation going a little bit. You also mentioned the anxiety that people are are feeling and you could hear it from the person who uh, the interview we played just a moment ago. What can those people be told at this point about their future? Do we do we know enough about long haulers yet? Uh, obviously, the answer is no. But what, what do we know? Right. We should say, and we've been saying this all along, you know, this is a novel virus. It's the novel coronavirus. It's new. There's so much we don't know about it. And because these people have been sick for now eight or nine months, uh, doctors and researchers are just going to continue to watch them and see if their symptoms resolve themselves. But they don't know if or when they'll get better. Again, I mentioned that some are starting to feel a little bit better, but they do have these relapse days, which is really sad. Lee, that woman you just heard from, uh, she has days where sometimes the brain fog is so bad. Sometimes her fatigue is so bad. And sometimes she can go out on a run and she feels like herself again. So really, it's so unclear right now. And this is something that of course, public health officials and scientists and doctors worldwide are going to continue to look at for months to come. Morgan Romero, thank you. When the story continues. Dude, the shark just came up out of the water. A shark attack on the Oregon coast that seems like something out of a movie, complete with a surfboard that had a bite taken out of it. Plus, Portland's NAACP just had a big shakeup. And we're going to take a look at how we got here. 
Hey, welcome back. You know that phone you're holding in your hand right now? Use it to scroll through Instagram and give us a follow at the story KGW. We post a lot of segments on there too, just in case you missed something, you want to check it out again or share it with somebody. Now, something pretty crazy that happened over the weekend on the Oregon coast. There was a shark attack, and those are very rare, but they do happen. This one happened near Seaside. A surfer named Cole Harrington was bitten in the leg. He's 20 years old. He's expected to survive. He's in the hospital right now. He had surgery last night. They're still really assessing the damage to his leg. But the surfboard, look at this. The shark, I mean, it, I, we said it was like something out of a movie. You can see the ind indentations from the teeth there in the, in the surfboard. Now, there's no video of this attack, but listen to the picture painted by one of the people who saw it happen. Dude, the shark just came up out of the water, and it came up and, like, spun, spun around in the air and came back down and pushed him underwater. He came popping right up and uh, he was like, I, shark just attacked me and uh, he was with it. So the guy right there actually helped get Cole out of the water. Someone then applied a tourniquet to his leg and the medics got him out of there. Now we're sending positive vibes his way tonight. We wish him a full recovery. We also spoke to Chris Havel from Oregon Parks and Recreation about just how common these types of attacks can be. It is rare. Uh, but we do have a large surfing community here, a large boating community. Um, so the, it's not, uh, it, it wouldn't be surprising if there were close calls and bumps. Sharks um, are pretty well tuned to what their prey food is. And sometimes they'll make a mistake. And uh, for instance, a surfboard can mimic the outline speed of a seal or a sea lion. Uh, and there can be uh, sort of a curious bumping uh, that goes on between sharks and people who are out on the water. Uh, so those times where we do hear about close calls, that's generally the sort of situation that we hear about. But uh, outright attacks are rare. Now, when we say rare, this is what we mean. The Florida Museum of Natural History tracks shark attacks. They've been doing that for a long time, since 1837. And according to them, Oregon has only had 28 in the past 183 years. That's an average of every one every six years. If you go further north, it's even rarer. Washington has only seen two attacks in that same time frame. Now, California, on the other hand, has seen 125 attacks. That's a lot more. But there are certain areas on the coast there where attacks are a lot more likely to happen. And they're dealing with a lot more coastline. Uh, the, the last sighting that we had that was verified was back in July in the seaside area. So you can tell from that there are certain areas where the food prey for sharks and where people who are playing tend to come close to each other. Once again, it's nothing to worry about. It's just one of those things that you plan for and you get to know so that you can enjoy the ocean, uh, and especially the Oregon public shore. Uh, you know, go out, enjoy it, have a good time, just do a little preparation. All right, good advice, right? He says the state usually puts up signs on the beaches where there's been a recent shark sighting. So if you see one, just keep your eyes peeled while you're out there in the water. If you surf. <laughs> You know, you know the story. Now, there's obviously been a lot of changes in all of our lives this year. On top of all of that, after the election, we've got some new leaders here locally and on the national level. But I want to focus on a different election right now in an organization that's been in Portland for more than 100 years. Portland's NAACP may be embarking on a new era. The organization recently elected a slate of new leaders that ran on the platform of restoring transparency and integrity to the branch. So, how did we get here? During a time of civil unrest in Portland, following the death of George Floyd, Reverend E.D. Mondanay, the former head of Portland's NAACP, stood front and center at rallies and marches. He appeared on national TV and wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post about the ongoing protests in our city. Portland's NAACP branch was flooded with donations and membership soared past a thousand, a lot for America's whitest city. But, in October, three men came forward to the Portland Mercury, alleging Mondanay repeatedly sexually, physically, and emotionally abused them in the 90s and 2000s. KGW spoke to one of these men, who chose to stay anonymous and use the name Ray. We had to start seeing him lauded as some great man, some hero, some kind person, and be drugged through our trauma again and again, and to be powerless against him. From age 17 to 29, Ray said Mondanay sexually, physically, psychologically, and emotionally abused him. For a man like him with a congregation and all this power to put his attention on you, and then over time to, to build you up. 
Mondanay has since denied all of this. Those allegations, as presented, bear no truth. But he still resigned shortly after the allegations came out, giving rise to a new chapter of leadership in Portland's NAACP. Sharon Gray Smith was recently elected as the branch's new president and will take office in January. And that's how we got here. So let's do a little bit more and meet some of these new leaders. First up, the person I just mentioned, Sharon Gary Smith, the new president who takes office in January. She has four decades of experience organizing for social justice, and she's one of the leading members of Rise Up PDX, a group formed last year to bring greater transparency and leadership to Portland's NAACP. She told us she wanted to change things after what she experienced in the branch. It was egregious, the environment, the toxicity, I can say that personally over the last several years. But we don't want that anymore, and we're responsible for not having that anymore. I come from being a grassroots, on the ground, in your face organizer for women's rights, for reproductive justice, for criminal reform. That's the body that's in here, and that's what might have been missing. We don't just talk about it. When the lights are on, we have practiced, we have done it, and we organized this change. There are also two new vice presidents, Tamia Deary and Donovan Smith. They also want to, changes, want to make changes to the branch, and part of that is through empowering the younger generation of black Portlanders in the organization. It wasn't just a message um, that we were going to bring accountability and transparency transparency and integrity to this organization. It was something that um, people who are involved in the branch uh, wanted to see and it's something that people were inspired enough to actually join this branch um, to help be a part of. Every, every one of us believe in social and racial justice. We don't necessarily all go about it in exactly the same way, but I definitely think that we work together to amplify and elevate each other's messages and to support each other. And I'm really excited about all of us coming together and working with our membership to find out what their priorities are so that we can continue to use the momentum that we have created through this process. The new leadership is also hoping to play a more prominent role in the local decision making about issues like police brutality and equity in education and health care. Hey, if you got a question, or you got something to say about the show, let me know. Get out that phone, send me an email, write me a Facebook message, use the hashtag HeyDan on Twitter. I'm going to read some of your comments, maybe answer a question or two when we finish the story right after this. All right, let's talk questions and comments here. This one in from Steve talking about Morgan's long hauler story. I've seen estimates, he wrote, of between 5 and 35% of COVID positives become long haulers. How common is this? So Morgan actually just walked in the studio because she's going to be anchoring, anchoring 630 for Laurel Porter. And she told me that one study from the CDC says one in three. So again, this is something they're still learning a lot about and trying to learn more about. So this is one study. Uh, Basically, watch the coverage this week, and that paired with some of the studies that have been done, you have to make up your own decision on, on long haulers and the contribution that COVID is playing to all of this. So uh, somebody else wrote in, Carol said, hey, Dan, thought you were going to get rid of that jarring music. Please do ASAP about to lose a viewer. Don't leave, Carol. Don't leave. Just tell yourself every day, I bet they'll change it tomorrow. Uh, and then uh, lastly, if someone gets and recovers from COVID, do they know, still need to get a vaccine? That has been changing a little bit too, but last I heard, they're gonna say yes. I'm not sure where that goes on the priority list of who or when you get it, but at this point, even if you've had COVID, I think they are recommend, recommending you get the vaccine. So got some other questions uh, coming in. I can't get to all of them right now. I'll try to send a couple responses to emails after the show. In the meantime, keep those questions coming. We'll answer a few of them on air too. That's it for tonight. See you next time. That's the story.